Good to go. And he told me by my, my, uh, my boss, William, a little bit of dumb shit stuff, so I will. Um, you will tell that, uh, good morning, and I, um, uh, I'm still not technical, that's possibly that's good, uh, pretty neat. Uh, not here to defend himself. Now, slight change, in, you can see the title, I'm talking about archipelagic um, baselines, archipelagic waters, archipelagic navigation issues. Um, you did have an earlier lecture on baselines. Did you deal with our wedding? Tweetingly, perhaps. I'll go into a bit more detail on that. Who's here from an archipelagic state? Okay. Where were we in Indonesia, Philippines? Okay. 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 Good. Okay, over 20 archipelagic states around the world, but some are less well known for being archipelagic. It's a little bit of history, look at our definition of archipelagic states. We're in the 40s now, there's rather more articles in the convention. We'll get there to the end by the end of tomorrow. Uh, archipelagic baselines definition. What are the waters are navigation through archipelagos? The concept of archipelagic states and archipelagic waters within archipelagic baselines, it was discussed in 1958 in the first conference on the river of the sea. Um, but there was there's not enough consensus to drive forward um, specific provisions on archipelagic states. So, as often is the case, states go ahead and practice forms. So, Indonesia went ahead, and we'll look at the detail of the, the baselines in a little bit, and why Indonesia felt the, the urge, the, the need to define archipelagic baselines. <coughs> In Indonesia, you don't actually declare base on the youth and West Point to the low water bar. In 1960, a couple of years after the 58 Convention. And that language, you can see, uh, will, will be reflected later in the code of the 1983 Convention. And in all honesty, the provisions of the Convention are largely modeled on Indonesia's practice. So oddly enough, Indonesia's practice does conform to the convention, largely. But we'll see there are a few quirks to do that. Philippines followed suit in 1961. So those are really the two forefathers of uh, the archipelagic status. But those claims were protested. There are some oddities around the Philippines by a lot of time they were not in conformity with the convention. There were more straight baselines rather than archipelagic. But there was a growing drive towards the acceptance of archipelagic status. One way to explain Indonesia's practice in maritime delimitation is related to the drive towards getting other states to support the idea of archipelagic, the archipelagic concept. Because it's always been strange to boundary scholars that Indonesia with such leading figures in terms of uh, maritime delimitation of the law of the sea and having such a prominent role in the law of the sea drafting has done seemingly done so badly in delimiting maritime boundaries with neighboring states. Pretty much all of Indonesia's agreed maritime boundaries with its neighbors are, as it were, on the wrong side of the media line. They're too close to Indonesia as opposed to the neighbor. And part of the explanation for that is that Indonesia was willing to be more flexible in its delimitation negotiations in order to gain recognition and support from states for the concept of archipelagic status. So, this is the definition of what an archipelagic state is. 
a group of islands, including parts of islands, interconnected waters and so forth, all historically bound together. Why is it that slightly strange phraseology? We know that an archipelago is composed of islands. Why parts of islands? This isn't just for the, the, the folk from Archipelagos, <laughs> but uh, I would imagine that you probably do know. Is here from Indonesia. Sorry. Could there be some islands that are shared? Correct. So again, Indonesia, Kalimantan is composed of part of Borneo, but not all of Borneo. Yurian uh, Jaya is the western half of uh, the island of New Guinea, so you have that have slightly strange credibility um, there. Okay. Functional impact. You can have archipelagic states which simply express themselves to be archipelagic states, and it's a, a symbolic uh, statement that they are, they are archipelagic states. It's a way to bind the archipelago together as a political entity, even though it's difficult, if not impossible, for those states to draw valid archipelagic baselines in mind about 1947. We'll look at that. Okay, I'll just stand here for a while. This is not to read. You've all got a copy of it. Um, it's simply to demonstrate that the, the article defining the rules for Article 47 for archipelagic baselines are long quite complex. But it really comes down to these factors. Major advantage for Archipelagic states. You can use the outermost rocks and reefs to anchor your archipelagic baselines. So that's quite expansive. You can use features that otherwise are, might be problematic. If you're simply using an island without archipelagic baselines, We've seen from the certainly the high bar that has been set by the tribunal in the South China Sea case, we have uh, features that um, may not be able to sustain a stable community of people or an economic life that is non-extractive in nature. In which case, you can't generate full term of your claim. Whereas if you're an archipelagic state, even if you've got a very insubstantial, uninhabited feature, and you use it as a base point for your anthropologic claims, your anthropologic base signs, it's in line with convention. So you're not, the, the status of that feature as a turning point, a base point for your anthropologic base signs, won't be challenged as being a rock rather than a fully fledged diamond, because it doesn't matter. So there's a huge potential advantage for anthropologic states. Here. You have to include the main islands, quote unquote, within your archipelago. Don't really know what main islands are. Doesn't doesn't define it. Is that that the island with your capital on it? Is it the one with most cultural significance, most economic significance? Is it the biggest one? We don't really know, but in a sense. It's never really come up as a problematic issue because, by default, archipelagic states are tending to, to include pretty much all of the islands they can with a few outliers. So, that has never been an issue that's been challenged. There is a test. I, li I like the provisions of the convention where you do have a mathematical objective test. Uh, so, for example, Article 7 to do with straight base science. You have ambiguous language, language that is open to interpretation. A fringe of islands. You know, Myron probably dealt with this. Uh, a fringe of islands along the coast for Article 7 straight based lines. There is an expert report, UN expert report on interpretation of Article 7. It very helpfully says that for there to be a fringe of islands, you need more than one. <laughs> Oh, well, I guess all of us could kind of go into that, to say. Um, whereas here, for archipelagic race lines, you need to fulfill the ratio test. You need to capture as much water as you have land territory, 
and up to nine times as much water as you have land territory. Why that ratio? It was a negotiated solution. So in one sense, we'll look at this in a, in a moment, it excludes states that are composed of islands or parts of islands, but are mainly large islands. A couple of large islands, you can't capture as, uh, as much water. So essentially, you're thinking of the UK. You can join Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK, um, and you still can't capture as much water as you need to fulfill the one-to-one -one ratio. So essentially it points archipelagic status towards more oceanic archipelagos. The nines one was really a, a, a negotiation where the maritime powers were concerned that small islands composed of small islands widely dispersed, if they were able to uh, join up those dispersed islands as an archipelago, through which there are special navigation regime, which we'll come to, then that would take out large chunks of the world ocean away from the overall freedom of navigation regime. So the maritime powers would want to constrict or restrict somewhat the ability of uh, archipelagic states to capture large areas of the ocean within archipelagic waters. And here you think of states like Kiribati. We'll look at the Kiribati situation uh, in a moment. There's also length limitations. No single segment should be more than 125 nautical miles long. That also stops dispersed archipelagos from, from being, being linked into an archipelagic baseline system. And there's a 3% rule. No more than 3% of your archipelagic baseline should be more than 100 nautical miles long. That's somewhat of a, an illusion in terms of being descriptive. Because who's drawing the baselines? The archipelagic state. So it, you can change the ratio. You can, you can take a, a long straight uh, long archipelagic baseline segment and break it up into smaller portions and you change the number of baseline segments and therefore change the percentage. So if you, if you need an additional long baseline segment beyond 100 miles, you simply break up other segments into shorter lengths. I will see an example of that in a moment. So you have tests, you have objective tests by which you can tell whether an archipelagic baseline system is uh, accords with Article 47 or not. You do have an additional uh, statement there that the, the overall uh, definition of the archipelagic system shouldn't depart from the general configuration of the archipelago. How do you tell general configuration? It's another of those concepts like general direction of the coast. I showed you the, the slide yesterday where it's a matter of scale and perception, and you can play with the angle. It's another concept that is easy to understand. It's a geographical concept of yeah, the general shape, configuration of the archipelago. Great. Well, I think we all understand what that means uh, at first glance, but actually being able to distinguish and test whether uh, a general configuration actually uh, is in accordance is, is much more problemat problematic because it's in the eye of the beholder to a certain extent. You can use low tide elevations in order to anchor your archipelagic baseline system, but only um, uh, if they are, have a, a lighthouse on them or they are wholly or partially within the territorial sea. And this reflects to an extent the the same provision that you find within an article 7 for straight baselines in terms of using low tide elevations with, either, with like a beacon or a lighthouse on them, all have received international recognition. And you'll remember from article 7, did Byron mention this in the context of uh, Norway? 
Norwegian baseline system was tested for the ICJ. Test with the UK, 1951. Uh, where the UK was essentially uh, objecting to the Norwegian straight baseline system that had been in place since the 1930s. And there, the ICJ effectively came down on the side of Norway and said, yes, this is valid in the context of deeply indented or cut into coastlines, like the northern coastline of Norway. In order for the convention, 1982 convention, to therefore develop rules for straight baselines and then archipelagic baselines, whereby the Norwegian system that had been approved by the ICJ was in accordance with the rules of the subsequent convention of 1982, they had to include rules that, in, that allowed the Norwegian system to be valid. And the Norwegian system includes low tide elevations with lighthouses on and with no lighthouses on. It's hence the phraseology of an international cut off. Um, this is in, again similar to Article 7. You can't draw straight baselines or archipelagic baselines such that you cut off another state from access to the to high seas. And again, we'll look at an example of how that works for custom work. Ratio calculations for that all important one to one to nine to one ratio. If you have, for example, an atoll, there's a lagoon inside, you could close it with a closing line and count the area of the atoll, the internal waters within the atoll, as land for purposes of calculation. And that can matter significantly. You can have internal waters, other types of straight, straight line type baselines can be defined within our overall archipelago system. So, Atoll. Close it with a closing line. And you have internal waters within the atoll. Uh, under Article 6, there's no dealing with reefs. There's no mention of closing lines. It's an omission from the convention. There's no rule relating to closing lines. But also, there's been no objection generally to states closing the entrances to atolls, even if there are multiple entrances to atolls, with a, with a closing line. States have simply uh, needed to do that in order to define areas of in internal waters versus areas which are beyond internal waters. So here we have an archipelago, another little animation. You draw archipelagic baselines around it. Now arguably, rather than putting archipelagic baselines all the way around, you can mix up your baselines so that you can use the normal baselines on the outer face of islands joined up by archipelagic baselines to the next island, rather than archipelagic baselines all the way around. You can have to find, for example, a bay closing line or a river closing line within the archipelago. So you can have internal waters within archipelagic waters. Then you don't generate your highest maritime jurisdiction in maritime zones, out to 200 miles, and potentially out to all extended continents. So, easy. Indonesia. Multiple archipelagic states around the world. We'll look at Indonesia in some detail. Sorry, not about that slide. And you have multiple states in, broadly speaking, our part of the world here. Okay. You do have a number of states that have argued that they are archipelagic states, but have not defined baselines, oops. And the ones in green recently have or have intimated that they, they will do so. So I've got to change my lists and update the slides 
and uh, we'll have a look at some of the, the examples here. There are particularly widespread dispersed archipelago. Um, the image to the bottom left is Tarawa, and again it's an, an atoll. Um, but it's what's called an almost atoll. That is, it's partially sunken. So what do you do with posing line in that scenario? Can you define a posing line all the way across here? Possibly. They haven't done so yet. But there you have a problematic issue because you don't have any rule on posing lines. There's certainly nothing that says how long they should be. But you do have these situations of atoll structures which sit on a reef platform and sink, or partially sink. So you have these almost atoll, U-shaped atoll type structures. The real thing about uh, states like Kiribati is they are widely dispersed. So the Tapitaro is over here. Three sets of islands, about 3,000 kilometers east to west. Huge exclusive economic, economic zone. Can you guess how many patrol ships Kiribati possesses? One. The Australian Pacific Patrol Boat Program, where Australia's old fleet of patrol boats have been donated to. Pacific Island States, they get one or two patrol boats. And we've got those, those vessels are the, pretty much the only patrol boats that most of these uh, Pacific Island States possess, uh, and they are old. They were pretty much old when they were handed over by Australia, and it took me 10 to 15 years ago. Um, by repute, anecdotally, um, we've been to Kiribati, the um, amount of marine diesel that they possess on an annual basis is enough for about 30 days of sea. So your capacity issues here in terms of maritime enforcement and surveillance are huge. That's slightly off topic. So we have states that cannot be archipelagos even though they're Opposed to violence. In principle, in somewhere like New Zealand, you could say we are an archipelagic state. Opposed to violence, or parts of violence, yes. Um, but in a sense, it uh, wouldn't properly fit the Kiwi worldview of being an archipelago, an archipelagic state, of being an islanders in the same way that it would for somewhere like Kiribati. Of course, why can't New Caledonia be an archipelagic state? Because it belongs to France. Correct. Because it is um, an integral part of France. But that depends on who you ask. True. <laughs> but but um, I believe that New, New Caledonia, like other French territories around the world, uh, like, like uh, French Guyana, for example, uh, like in the Guadeloupe and Martinique and then in the Caribbean. You step on Guadeloupe or Martinique, you're in the European Union. Because they are integral parts of France in a, a dissimilar way to the way, for example, the UK treats the last pink bits around the world. UK external territories. So they're different to the mainland UK in a different way to how France treats its Obviously, with Denmark. Was Denmark uh, ah, well, Denmark. Are you talking about Denmark or are you talking about the kingdom of Denmark? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the correct distinction to make? <laughs> yes. So well, we have home rule for, for different parts of the kingdom of Denmark. But Denmark itself is, is, is a small peninsula uh, on, in Northern Europe. Whereas the kingdom of Denmark spans the, 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 the northern hemisphere in the Atlantic, North Atlantic. So it's huge. This kingdom of Denmark, 
that uh, because Denmark itself is attached to uh, continental Europe. So it, it, Greenland in, its, in isolation is an island, but I think you struggle with the one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, Pharaohs, possibly, in isolation, yes. What about New Zealand? New Zealand, New Zealand? New Zealand can't capture enough water. Even if you could pu push a, an archaeological baseline out to the Chatham Island, you can't make the one-to-one -one ratio. That's why. So, in, in the small island, I'm not thinking that there are dependent of these other countries. Do they have also uh, new zones and your people? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they do. They do. And in, in many cases, they have straight baselines that look an awful lot like archaeological baselines. Pharaohs is similar. Has straight baselines around around Faroe Islands. So, in isolation, you think, well, are these archaeological or not? But they look, look very similar. Indonesia, have a little look at Indonesia because uh, it's really the grandfather figure for grandmother figure for, for the art budget concept. 1960 baselines, 8,000 kilometers long, encompassing all of the Indonesian archipelago. So, on the basis of the, the characteristics and the peculiarity of, it, of Indonesia as an art budget state, should be regarded as a single unit. This is a political issue, issue and it is for many archipelagic states. Drawing archipelagic baselines around the whole uh, of the, the, all of the islands is a way of binding them all together as one single political unit. And the Indonesian system, the Indonesian state, is, has been consistently concerned about breaking up insurgency movements, separatist movements. Potentially Niri and Jaya is a good example. In Aceh is another example. So a way of binding the whole country together through the archipelagic concept of regarding the waters between the islands as being integral to the state. That's what drives the idea of the archipelagic concept. So here we have the land territory and a three mile zone as was. And the real problem from an Indonesian perspective is how the islands are dispersed and disconnected from one another. So if we look at uh, off Sumatra, then you have a situation where you have separation between the islands and a three mile zone. And that was unsatisfactory. It meant that things were divided. So, 1957 law, the Jaranda Declaration, oops, drawing the archipelagic baselines around Indonesia and claiming archipelagic waters within. And that looks relatively similar to Indonesia's current claim, and it's what really Article 47 is, uh, is based upon. One thing I would draw your attention to, and we'll come back to, is that Indonesia left a, a door ajar. It's not completely. Because here we have, at that time, Portuguese Timor. And the archipelagic base lines came up to this point, and they started to get to that point. So I'll shave it in a bit too much. Actually, my student, the former student, Andy Asana, has shaded it a bit too much. Uh, he creates these um, wonderful animations. Because you could sail around Portuguese to more and into Indonesia's archipelagic waters without ever crossing an archipelagic baseline. So there was a back door left open. That's been fixed. And then you generate your territorial sea, and subsequent to the 1982 convention, generate your uh, EZ and continental shelf, and Indonesia has progressed substantially in terms of delimiting many of these maritime boundaries, but not all maritime boundaries. Indonesia has signed 22 
expand the agreements with neighbor states. And even as uh, a extended continental shelf area, partial submission of that area of that. As an aside, the, that submission of extended continental shelf is instructive because it shows the role of the Commission. When the co Commission on the Limits and Continental Shelf was being uh, constructed and people were writing about it and thinking about it, they took thinking of the CLCS as maybe playing a role of gatekeeper. The gamekeeper to keep away excessive claims on the parts of states and to safeguard the common heritage, the area, the extent of the area. Hasn't quite turned out that way. And this is a good illustration of it. Because Indonesia put in its submission of Sumatra, held discussions with the commission in New York, with the sub-commission, and the sub-commission looked at the, the submission documents and said to Indonesia, you haven't paid enough. Come back and expand your submission area and work with Indonesia in order to maximize Indonesia's submission. Which isn't quite the same as people were expecting the commission to act as that in that gatekeeper role. Let's get through that. And one of the issues here was that Indonesia has progressively changed and adapted its archipelagic basin. Originally, there was a, a pretty notch or embayment in the Indonesian baseline system, and they closed that gap. 2002, new legislation that got most of the way around, not completely. But also at the same time, there was an ongoing dispute with Malaysia over Pulau Sipadan, Pulau Ligatan, that went to the International Court of Justice, because over the sovereignty of two islands up off the uh, Kalimantan Sabah boundary up in the Southern Sea. And Indonesia changed its space lines to use the disputed islands as part of its archaeological base line system. Fortunately, for, from an Indonesian perspective, the ICJ determined both islands to be under Malaysian sovereignty, not Indonesian. So again, Indonesia had to change its baseline system. And it did so in this fashion. So there's land boundary, Pulau Sipadan, Pulau Ligatan, oops, sorry, all the way around. Um, there's the original architectural baseline system. It changed 2002. Baseline system including through our system, Ligatan and Sipadan. Uh, and then following the judgment, you can't really anchor your archipelagic baseline system off someone else's islands. So it had to have another change the system. And Indonesia added in this long archipelagic baseline segment that was over 100 miles long. Miles long. That broke, would have broken the 3% rule, so they had to make another change elsewhere. We'll come to it in a moment. But also off two more, you can see the back door to the um, Indonesian archipelago um, that had previously been the case. 2008, Indonesia closed the gap, closed the loop, and defined additional archipelago baselines along these islands and down to the northern terminus of the land boundary between Timor Leste and West Timor. Good. But, Okusi, correct. Uh, the Okusi Enclave, this area here, is under the sovereignty of Timor Leste. So now the coastal front of Okusi is locked within Indonesia's archipelagic waters because of that baseline statement. Remember that provision around cutoff? I fear that um, I think Indonesia may be in trouble on that point. Indonesia and Timor Leste have initiated maritime boundary delimitation negotiations just earlier this year. I believe the cutoff would be 
a point of contention or an issue that both sides will need to overcome. Because I can't see a more explicit case of cutoff of placing someone else's territory within your archipelagic waters. And here on the south coast of Java, we have a situation I was talking about to meet the 3% rule because Indonesia needed a long segment of Borneo, of Kalimantan. Uh, then the original long segment here was broken into three in order to change the percentage, change the ratio. Philippines, again, a long time proponent of archipelagic concept, and yet for a long time the in Philippines claims uh, didn't meet the, the rules. Because in the Philippines claimed straight baselines and internal waters within the straight baselines, not archipelagic baselines, but archipelagic waters within. However, in 2009, the Philippines revised its baselines uh, law and brought it into, into line with the Water Sea Convention. At the same time, <coughs> Indonesia, uh, sorry, the Philippines stepped away from its former historic claim for the so-called treaty limits. This is the box, the Philippines box, so-called, which is defined by a series of end of the 19th, uh, end of the 19th century treaties designed around the transfer of the Philippines from Spanish jurisdiction sovereignty to US. And for a long time, the Philippines has clung to the treaty limits, whereby it's played a double game, or played a double game, signing up to the Law of the Sea Convention, but at the same time, claiming territorial sea jurisdiction at the limits of the box. So on the one hand, the convention says the limit of the territorial sea is 1,200 miles, and the Philippines was claiming out to 285 nautical miles at the limits of the box. But now the Philippines has officially stepped away from, from its claims to the box and brought its claims into line with the convention, and did so, of course, prior to In other words, you could always say in the South China Sea context, well, China has some questionable historic claims, but they're not alone when you have the Philippines claiming a dubious, historically inspired uh, claim, which is similar to the, those mines of allocation, which I mentioned uh, in terms of maritime conversation yesterday. The Philippines has quietly stepped away from those claims. Other examples, classic um, archipelago would be somewhere like Vanuatu. It's a whole series of archipelagos in the South Pacific, as you imagine. Uh, countries that are composed of islands, or of the islands. Fiji is another good example whereby this demonstrates that you have an overall archipelagic system that doesn't stop you having outliers, outlying islands or multiple systems of Archipelagic waters. You don't have to enfold every single island you have within your system, or at least within one system. Solomon Islands it demonstrates that again, multiple systems of archipelagic uh, baselines and therefore archipelagic waters. And we have some of those uh, islands, island states which many people thought it was impossible for the states to actually define archipelagic baselines and waters that were valid and in line with the convention, like Seychelles. Yet yeah, Seychelles has recently managed to do so, but they are relatively constrained, confined areas of archipelagic waters. Because we're talking about islands that are relatively far away from one another and have a relatively small land area. So you're always in problems with the land and water ratio. Same applies to, I mean, same applies to Kiribati. Tiny areas of land, and so even nine times your tiny area of land, it still isn't very large. So there's always been this, this tension, this uh, trying to achieve valid archipelagic baselines uh, where for very small islands. 
I would say that we, we tend to talk about the Pacific island states as small island states. The preference in the region now, these days is to really talk about large ocean states. Because somewhere like Kiribati is a small island state in terms of its territory, but it's got a vast maritime space under its jurisdiction. And then we have the outliers. The unexpected of the Atlantic states. Jamaica, you generally think of as one island. So how would it be an Atlantic state given the rules? But it can. Because it's got a few outlying features. If you join them up, these uh, coral caves and rocks to the south of Jamaica, they just about fulfill the one to one ratio. So under the mathematical tests, Jamaica is a, an Atlantic state. Flip side to that is, does it really fulfill the, the requirement that uh, the Atlantic baselines reflect uh, the overall configuration of the archipelago? Arguably not. But no one's challenged it. And it's that only a picture paper where you have lots of Basin, a lot of segments around each end of each island, north and south, then two long segments joining them up. Is that consistent with the configuration of the archipelago? Somewhat questionable. But it hasn't had a huge impact. As far as I'm aware, those archipelago baselines didn't play a major role in the delimitation negotiations, for example, with Nigeria which turned into a joint zone. Okay. There is an obligation to publicize base sites, not necessarily normal base sites, but other types of straight line baseline, the straight baselines themselves, river closing lines, bay closing lines, but also archipelagic baselines. And here I'll, I'll take a little excursion into sea level rise issues and how I was I mentioned briefly in context of Professor Soon's talk about how South uh, Pacific Island states are using this provision, positing the location of baselines as a means to, in a sense, hopefully protect their maritime jurisdictions from sea level rise. So this is from the Pacific Island community, the latest map that I have of status of the Pacific Island states in terms of their maritime jurisdiction. The light, light blue shading, these are for states where their maritime claims have been deposited with the UN Secretary General, therefore Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea. And what that means is depositing not just the location of baselines, but also the closing lines and defining the limits of territorial sea, contiguous zone, EZ, and continental shelf, sometimes in excruciating detail. The latest one earlier this year, Marshall Islands Declaration, all of those different types of baseline and maritime zone defined including the arcs for 12 miles, 24 and 200 miles. The declaration accompanying the, the act is 451 pages long. That's because essentially it is providing coordinates so that you can find the curves, the arcs of 12, 24 and 200 multiple miles through coordinates which are joined up by straight lines. They're essentially in text form, paper form, long list of coordinates, they're expressing a geographical information systems file. Because that is a way that you can deposit with the UN. You can't simply send them a GIS. You can't send them a, send them a, a disk or hand them a, a flash drive. You've got to give them text. Why have they done that? Well, it essentially, it fits in with the, I'll come back to that one. Uh, it fits in with the idea of trying to preserve their uh, maritime jurisdiction. I do expect protest. 
it might not be a protest related to the underlying intent of preserving maritime jurisdiction, but that would be interesting if that occurred. But there's going to be a protest because this feature here, which is included in the Marshall Islands Declaration, however, it's otherwise known as Wake Island under the jurisdiction of the United States of America. So the inclusion of a feature that is under the control administration and the US, at least the sovereignty of the US, in, uh, in your declaration, I would think that the State Department will react, whether the president-elect reacts and takes on, a, uh, <laughs> takes on the Marshall Islands, we'll have to see. But the other issue, though, where there may be a protest from the US, and you've probably already heard of the, the US Freedom of Navigation Program, U.S. is the serial protester in the world of the law and the sea. Because the U.S. systematically analyzes the practice of other states and issues protests if that practice is contrary to the U.S. interpretation of the law and the sea convention. Here, it will be interesting. There are two areas of archipelagic waters that have been defined by the Marshall Islands. Uh, it's uh, for the Raleigh and Ratak archipelago groups. Land water ratio. In combination, they are just under the 1 to 9 ratio. So Raleigh, whoops, pardon me. The, I believe it's the Raleigh, Raleigh group fulfills the ratio on its own. The Ratak doesn't. One of them is just over the 1 to 9 ratio. The other is just, a, uh, just over one, 1 to 8, uh, 1.83. But in combination, they fulfill the ratio. Is it valid? My suspicion is that the US interpretation will be conservative. It will say, this is invalid. Each individual system has to fulfill the ratio. But that's not clear. It's not settled. We haven't had a test for that. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I talked a little bit about Pacific Island issues and, and sea level rise. This is typical of the type of uh, environment that we see. Islands are within the reef structure. They're, they're composed of coralline sand, coral rubble. The islands where people live the above high tide features that make them make the whole uh, island capable of generating maritime claims, that is dependent on and is constructed through the reef structure. The reef, uh, a healthy coral reef, provides the sediment, provides the material that then builds up and feeds the islands of the above high tide within the reef. So having a healthy coral reef is crucial to the continued survival of above high tide features. So you have a dynamic beach, you have the edge of the high tide feature, but what's really provided the baseline is the edge of the reef, the low tide line at the edge of the reef, on the atoll <coughs> edge. And usually that's relatively easy to find with the aerial photography or satellite imagery because you have a a steep scarp slope on that on that reef edge. So you have both high tide features where people live within the reef, but it's the outermost parts of the reef that provide the baseline and the critical base points on that baseline then provide uh, the points from which you generate your maritime zone. Not much monitoring, not so much systematic monitoring in the region, so you may not know about changes very easily. What you can do, though, and what uh, this is a slide provided by my colleague, uh, Dr. Arthur Webb, who ran the um, South Pacific Applied Geoscience Commission Ocean and Islands program for many years, is you can compare modern satellite imagery with the best aerial photography we have the oldest historical aerial photography we have, which oddly enough comes from the 1940s, from the US government, US military. So here we have uh, satellite imagery, and you can 
overlay with a historical function. Pretty much perfect match. This is, this is something of an oddity. The narrative about small island states, Pacific island states, is about sea level rise, threat, inundation, disappearance of states. And a lot of the debates are led by those concerns. When you actually look at the, the analysis of aerial photography versus then and now over a 50 odd year period, it's still in the same place. Shorelines are in the same place. Uh, Webb and Kench, a uh, good article on this, looked at over 40 atolls in the mid Pacific and found that by 86% of them were either the same size or bigger than they were at the start of this in, in 40 or 50 years ago. This is against the context of accelerated sea level rise in the region. What's going on? Reality so far is that many of the reef edges have been stable. They've been stable over considerable periods of time, hundreds of years, thousands of years. And that is related to the ability of a healthy reef to keep up with change in sea level. The question is whether these reefs will be able to keep up. If we accept that we're going to have accelerated sea level rise, and particularly in this part of the world, will the reefs be able to keep up in the context of a warming ocean and an acidifying ocean, and against the context of accelerated sea level rise? They, they can be stable in terms of their position, their location. And that's crucial because the, the, the reef edges are your baselines. The difficulty here is whether, whilst that's been the case in the past, and we have strong scientific evidence that the reef, reefs have been able to maintain their position and maintain their, their health to an extent, the double-edged problem here if reefs are unable to keep up against the context of accelerated sea level rise, so they've got to grow more, but their ability to do so is compromised by a warmer ocean, we know the oceans are warming, and they are acidified, which compromises the ability of calcifying organisms to build. We don't know whether reefs will be able to keep up and the double-edged issue of this is potentially losing position of your low water line from which you generate maritime claims. But if the reef is less productive, it won't generate the sediments that are required to maintain the islands. And also, if, it, if the reef is, is compromised, it will provide less protection for the islands within. So you'll get more erosion. And then you'll get like, impact on the habitability of the feature if it no longer is a habitable feature, it can't generate a full maritime zone out of 200 miles. So that is the threat that we have. Right, I better hurry up. Um, there's a little bit about sea level rise there, about um, the, the issues of, of, uh, of the hottest years that we've seen, uh, projections for sea level rise derived from the IPCC latest um, report, uh, AR5. We are aware that the impacts of global warming on the oceans are variable, both temporally and spatially. So we're seeing much more warming in the, towards the polar regions. But we're also seeing variability in sea level rise globally. This is the area that we're really looking at in the South Pacific. This we'll talk. And we have a whole range of projections from the do nothing, steady as she goes scenario, which would deliver a worst case scenario in terms of our CO2 into the oceans, to a what we're hoping for the Paris Accord, which may be on some of the first things on the agenda of the US president, new US president to withdraw from, in which case the whole accord may collapse. The study that uh, Arthur Webb was undertaking was assuming essentially a mid-range of the worst case scenario. Now his geo 
a geoscientist, so he takes a, a longer view than, than we generally would, certainly longer than an electoral cycle, and to 200 years. And there you would see sea level rise potentially in the five to six meter range. Potentially, we'll have to see. One of the other factors here for islands is that whilst you may see islands being capable of remaining above high tide, so the main island features, doesn't necessarily mean they'll stay in the same place. And that's really impacts for uh, the ability of people living on islands to sit and for them to remain, remain happy. So islands can migrate across the platform. Even when we have islands and in the Pacific, there are, there are raised limestone and volcanic features which are definitely going to remain uh, tens and hundreds of meters elevation, so they're not going to be inundated anytime soon. But even if, so most of the development is around the coast. So the huge potential impacts even when you're having islands that are above, uh, substantially above my time. Uh, uh, a projection is the future after 200 years, worst case scenario, somewhere like French Polynesia, that's the kind of impacts we could see unless we freeze the baselines or freeze the outer limits. That's French Polynesia and the potential losses of the Z area. Against the backdrop of that, we have the Pacific Ocean scape, uh, the Pacific Island states and countries and territories. So the, in their national interest to deposit charts with the United Nations, sorry, I put a picture in the wrong place, uh, and that they should do so in a coordinated fashion so as to preserve zones of maritime jurisdiction. And that's why the Marshall Islands has gone to the lengths it has, depositing 451 pages of declaration defining the outer limits of its maritime zones in such detail. Archipelagic baselines and maritime delimitation. Uh, I'm probably here running out of time here, but archipelagic states have been very keen to have archipelagic baselines count. Now, surprise, surprise, between Philippines and Indonesia, both states are archipelagic states, so archipelagic baselines did indeed have an impact. But Indonesia has been keen in recent, recent delimitations, 2009 delimitation, 2014 delimitation in Singapore for its archipelagic baselines to have an influence on the location of the, the boundary line with Singapore. Singapore agreed to that, but it wasn't really that much at stake. Because you're only talking about a very narrow body of water between Singapore and the neighboring Indonesian island. So archipelagic waters within defined archipelagic baselines um, they are under the sovereignty of the coastal state rather than sovereign lands. Uh, there are a series of provisions related to uh, archipelagic waters and particularly what we're going to focus on um, navigation issues. But it, it is the case that there are also traditional navigational and fishing rights potentially within archipelagic waters. So you have another state having preferential rights within your archipelagic waters. Uh, the best example of that is uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, the extension of Indonesia's archipelagic baselines around the Natuna group means that the, those archipelagic waters of, it, of Indonesia lie between Peninsula Malaysia and Sarawak and Sabah uh, provinces of Malaysia on Borneo. So there's an agreement between Indonesia and Malaysia allowing preferential access, navigation, as well as fishing rights through that area of Indonesian archipelagic water standing between the two parts of the lake. Now, navigation rights under the convention. The great advantage of, of defining archipelagic waters and the, within archipelagic baselines is that you can potentially have an expansive area of archipelagic waters to the outermost rocks and reefs of your archipelago under the full sovereignty of your coastal state. The flip side to that is the commitments in relation to archipelagic sea lanes passage. 
And it has to be admitted that these, that these there have been challenges in actually operationalizing these. States have been keen to do to find archipelagic baselines and archipelagic waters, rather less keen to define the archipelagic sealant. Well, the, the only state that we have is Indonesia. But let's look at the rights. So the right of Minnesota Passage exists here in all Arctic <coughs> waters unless archipelagic sea lanes have been defined. And that Minnesota Passage uh, is without discrimination, can be suspended temporarily and can be suspended by area when no visitors from other areas. Archipelagic sea lanes passage, applicable to both sea and air, available to all ships and aircraft, so it includes military ships and aircraft. It includes all normal routes used for international navigation. So this is a big responsibility for the Archipelagic States to define these Archipelagic sea lanes. On the flip side, states using Archipelagic sea lanes must transit, that transit must be continuous, expeditious, and unobstructed. <coughs> and that language is very similar to transit rights passage. Vessels can transit through archipelagic sea lanes in normal mode. Okay, what is normal mode? We'll come back to this. I'm a submarine. What's my normal mode? Now it's up to the archipelagic state to ensure the safety of archipelagic sea lanes passage. That means there's a responsibility on the archipelagic state, an obligation, perhaps to undertake hydrographic survey so that submarines may pass through archipelagic sea lanes in normal mode. Okay. Maneuvering the submarine because what if I'm an archipelagic state and I don't want a submarine around my water, so I don't have to preserve it. But this is the flip side of the obligation to the opportunity of becoming an archipelagic state and defining archipelagic waters. This was the package deal. Okay, I'm changing my statement. Sir. There is a capacity issue there, yes. But there is, uh, on, the, on the face of it, the responsibility is on the architecture state to ensure safety and navigation. Of course, there is a responsibility also on the user states to ensure that they don't undertake navigation in a way that's hazardous. Okay, I'm no longer a submarine. I'm an aircraft carrier. What's my intent there? Okay. It's very similar. And I'll come back to the, uh, some of the responsibilities which refer back to the transit passage regi regime from within the archipelago uh, navigational regime. Where was it? I'm, a, I'm an aircraft carrier. What's my normal mode? Can you clarify a summary of two transit in normal mode? Or yep. Yes, it can. So, can do it otherwise? That would be my interpretation of a submarine's normal mode. They're designed to go underwater. So, similarly, what if I'm an aircraft carrier? What's my normal mode? Underwater. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm confused. I'm not, I'm not a military guy, but I, I, I would say that um, a, a, an aircraft carrier generally tends to have a supporting number of units around it, tends to fly a combat air patrol over it, is continuously undertaking operations with helicopters and aircraft, other aircraft, potentially through another state's archipelagic waters. We've had incidents Say about the, between Indonesia and the US, where the US sailed through the central portion of the Indonesian archipelago just north of Java 
with an air, uh, air carrier battle group and did so in normal mode. And when the, the Indonesians scrambled fighter aircraft to challenge the US aircraft protecting the carrier, uh, the US pilots simply said, we're in international waters, which is a, an interesting interpretation from the US of, of what international waters is. That is the terminology the US usually uses in relation to anything that's not territorial sea. But that was the justification at the time. Admittedly, it's a product pilot. And no suspension of those lines. You must undertake archipelagic sea lanes passage within the designated archipelagic sea lane. If there's no sea lane, then you can use all routes that you believe are used in your own application. There are designated lanes within archipelagic sea lanes. That's the, the idea. Indonesia is our only example to date with a partial de designation of archipelagic sea lanes, which we'll look at. And you must give a few publicity to those lanes. So we'll look at. Can I ask a question about the aircraft carrier? <coughs> no, you said it. <laughs> um, the aircraft carrier will have planes that takes off and lands on the aircraft carrier in archipelagic waters. Ironically, though, archipelagic waters, which are inside of, in, of territorial sea waters, and in an innocent passage right in territorial sea, you cannot land or take or onboard military devices. So, well, it's odd because the closer you get to the core of the country, you're claiming a, an alleged right for an yeah. aircraft carrier that you do not have in waters that are much further seaward. Yes. And that, I think that was understood at the time. This is not just my cleverness, although you have to look it up. But, <laughs> but I just wonder whether that the interpretation the United States has put on the aircraft carrier for landing and takeoff is bit of a stretch beyond what they thought. Yeah, and certainly the, I, I would tend to agree with that, and certainly the, the, the incident that I referred you to, uh, where which totally disrupted all civil uh, aircraft yeah. passage uh, through the central part of Indonesia as a consequence of it, because the uh, fighter jets were rolling around one another. Um, and the interpretation there of places, this is international waters, is yeah, certainly pushing the end point. Yeah, if an aircraft is alone, it should be following the O flight through the Archimedes Sea Lane. But in the context that we're talking about of an aircraft that's launched and recovered to a, to a carrier or another warship, then one interpretation is that that's part of normal mode. And that's certainly, as far as I'm aware, the US interpretation. But I'll uh, come back to it. The passage must be continuous and expeditious. So we ha had an issue here uh, which, uh, for Australia, where an Australian vessel, um, Australian naval vessel from north of located north of Indonesia wanted to meet up with a tanker coming from Australia to refuel and wanted to do so in an archipelagic sea lane. Is that valid? In the end, they found a different way to do it. They decided that to stop and refuel inside an archipelagic sea lane would not constitute continuous and expeditious passage. So they shied away from that. I have a question. I'm very confused. Are the articulated waters in the Indonesia in Indonesia passage in territorial sea in the Delta Archipelago? Very similar because they're both under sovereignty of the of the coastal state. And similar also that in the absence of archipelagic sea lanes being designated, 
then there is a, a right of innocent passage within the yeah, archipelagic like waters. And the archipelagic sea lanes passage is very similar to the right of transit passage through straits used for international navigation. This is again part of the package deal. If you uh, giving the opportunity to or confirming the rights of archipelagic states to enclose large areas of the ocean as archipelagic waters and sovereignty, the flip side to it is the responsibility to define archipelagic sea lanes. And here's the, the problem as seen, seen from the perspective of maritime states is that numerous states have defined archipelagic baselines and archipelagic waters. Only one, the Philippines is following suit and has got proposed archipelagic sea lanes. Only one state, Indonesia, has defined archipelagic sea lanes that have been accepted by the IMO. In fact, the uh, on the lanes issue, I'll quickly go through the issue. There are some tricky rules on this in terms of there's an access to the lane, the archipelagic sea lane. Um, but there's a 10% rule to try and shield the islands that were uh, near, the, near the lane. So there's probably, you've got the text there, but this is the idea. You have a wide lane, 25 nautical miles either side of the axis line through the archipelago. 10% rule, you're not allowed within 10% of the width of the lane to the nearest island. So if we had, if, we, if, if we were through the ASL, and passing near an island and there was only 10 miles from the axis line to the island, you could only navigate with, within nine miles away from the axis line or within one mile of the island itself. And another example of that, a lane that's squeezed between two islands, and again the 10% rule will apply so you don't come too close to the island in the straight within the upper sea lane and different ways to calculate that where we have limited uh, practice to actually determine what will be the valid interpretation of distance between the islands and the axis line. How close passing vessels using NSL passage are to come to the islands within the island. Of course this is a concern to archipelagic states like Indonesia of having the vessels of other states, including military vessels, too close to their land territory. So those are the archipelagic sea lanes that Indonesia has defined through its archipelago. All of them north-south. Nothing east-west. Indonesia was concerned that putting an ASL through the east-west route through the Java Sea would be too close to Jakarta, too close to a heavy, heavy concentration of Indonesian population on, on Java. And yet at the same time, in the absence of an ASL, vessels passing through Indonesia can use routes used for normal navigation. So in a way, Indonesia has, to my mind, shot itself a little bit in the foot because they haven't controlled where the navigation route is. If they defined an ASL on the east-west route, then vessels would tend to follow the ASL. Um, we have this one situation where we have one state that has defined valid, largely valid, uh, baselines and some ASLs, they've gone through a process of negotiation through the International Maritime Organization and Indonesia has made a partial, a partial designation for east, for north-south lanes has been accepted. We also have a number of states that have defined valid sets of archipelagic baselines and therefore archipelagic waters that have not defined ASLs yet. Philippines has some which have been proposed. I don't know quite where that, that they are in the, in the negotiations with the island. There we've got the, the issue of whether archipelagic sea lane passage is affected by the absence of ASLs. 
and there is clear in Article 5312, if an earthquake state does not des designate sea lanes or air routes, uh, then the, the uh, sorry, um, then our quite sea lanes passage may be exercised through those normal routes used for navigation. So in that sense, uh, the U.S. carrier group going east-west through the Indonesian archipelago was simply using a, a route used for normal navigation. I think it would be difficult for Indonesia to argue that the Java Sea east-west route through the archipelago is not a route used for normal navigation. We do have some states that have defined archaeological baselines that are not in accordance with Article 47. So, for an example, I'm not picking on Cat Verde here, um, but uh, the definition of uh, lines for Cat Verde imposes too much water relative to land, and therefore is not valid under the ratio rule under Article 47. So, in that, con that context, you can't have archipelagic sea lanes through invalidly defined archipelagic waters for the right of archipelagic sea lanes passage would not exist. However, you have the normal freedom of navigation or innocent passage through the territorial seas around the islands. This is the issue, this would be uh, the way in which the regime for archipelagic sea lanes refers back to the regime for, for transit passage. So there's a, an obligation for vessels to proceed without delay in a continuous and expeditious manner. There's a prohibition on MSR, and you have to comply with the coastal state laws related to sexual navigation, pollution, fishing, uh, fisheries navigation, and sanitation customs, which are the laws that exist within the contiguous zone. On the flip side, the coastal state is not to hamper us. And then coming back to the issue of normal mode, this has probably been a, probably a more contentious issue for archipelagic states and probably is why archipelagic states have been reluctant to define air cells through their archipelagic waters because of the perceived threat of other states' warships passing through their archipelagic waters. Having said that, in the absence of ASLs, then these navigational rights persist. So, to my mind, it would be a more sensible approach from our Atlantic states to define their ASLs. But clearly, there's been a, an absence of uptake to for our Atlantic states to actually define their ASLs. And it's been pretty challenging for our Atlantic states to do so. Um, there are a number of states that have enacted legislation which conflicts with that right of archipelagic sea lanes passage for foreign warships. And uh, in the same manner that there has been a push from a number of states to, in the words of Bernie Oxman, to territorialize the exclusive economic zone and demand that foreign states have uh, declared themselves to in order to either register for passage through water, uh, a state's waters, be it, be it EZ or territorial sea or archipelagic waters, uh, and in a sense forbid foreign warships to do so. <coughs> Contrary to the deal that was worked out uh, at the third conference on the Lord of the Sea, whereby there is freedom of navigation applying to naval vessels. So, in terms of implementation, we have an increasing number of archipelagic states. We've had some recent practice where states we thought it was difficult for them to define archipelagic baselines. And that includes the likes of uh, Seychelles and uh, Kiribati are defining limited sets of archipelagic baselines. So, an increasing uptake of archipelagic status and the benefits that go with our quite status, but we still have an unfinished, unfinished business in terms of navigational issues, differing interpretations on what is normal mode, for example, uh, and also 
an absence of a complete set of aquatic sea lanes, and that would be an evolving issue. Thank you very much. Any questions?